this uh, uh, oh Liz, Liz you've got a question no sorry <laughs> <laughs> just stretching your arm <laughs> uh, who is uh, a well known author and uh, historian she's um, um, knows a great deal about uh, medieval well about pilgrimage from the medieval times yeah. onwards and she's going to tell us take us through the history of pilgrimage which will be really fascinating so we are the latest manifestation of pilgrimage and she will uh, take us back to the start um, I have to apologize because I actually stopped everyone too early at the end of the last uh, the last talk <coughs> uh, but um, I, th I felt you were all hungry um, <laughs> So we will try, and uh, as a result of that, we sort of you, you lost the opportunity to, to, to ask questions of Sarah um, and, and more of David. We will try and find we will try and find an opportunity later for um, for a, a, a short period of questions for Sarah and David and Karen. So Karen Rolls, I'd like to introduce you. Thank you, all of you, and I'm very glad to be back to be gatekeeper again. It's been a few years, and it's been the most amazing morning. I think we'll all agree. A lot of good things brought up, and I am a medieval historian, but I'm going to start out by saying there will be no maps in this talk and no uh, um, concept of history, the way we usually think of that, getting information from books and archives and libraries for archaeology, because I want to start out by challenging all of us today to re-look at what history is and what it really is and how it transmits to us. There's many ways we can get information about the past all of the other written things that we usually have, but mainly, part there's three things we need to think about with pilgrimage, no matter what era of history you're looking at. And one is the sacred place itself, two is the element of time in relation to that space, and the third thing is our own consciousness, or soul, or spirit, when we go there. And another idea that's come through a lot for me recently and a lot of other people is the idea of revisiting a place again. For example, if you go back to Avery or Stonehenge or Rosalind Chapel or places that you like to visit for whatever reason, <coughs> you may or may not receive or connect with the same information the second time you go because you have changed you're there at a different time, and the whole interaction and overlapping energies of time, space, and consciousness are different. So just keep that kind of in the back of our minds as we go through what I'm sort of calling is this time is a visual odyssey. So there will be no words on the screen. I don't use PowerPoint on principle. <laughs> um, I don't need to do that because history, in this case, is about what we see, and, the, and then let the images speak for themselves. So I'm going to start off with the Green Man of Roslyn Chapel, which um, many, how many of you have been to Roslyn? Quite a few. Yes, it's dear to many of our hearts for some time. This is one of the um, images that is sort of a phenomenon that happens at some historical sites. There, there becomes an image that becomes like an icon iconic thing people think about when you say Roslyn Chapel. It's not usually some of the more traditional medieval carvings there that people mention. It's the green man, the web of life, the interconnections between the different layers of history in one place. And Roslyn is but one example. You have the, the inherent natural power of the land, and the glen, Ironically, historically, the chapel was built partly because of the glen and the area around it, the landscape. So we have a, a connecting link between people, places, and time. So the green man is kind of going to be our guide, and he'll pop up every now and then. So I start with this idea about the web of life, the interconnection of 
Why we're here today, the gatekeeper had a wonderful quote by Thomas Berry about how have we lost the conversation with the natural world in our modern time, for the most part. We've gotten carried away with a lot of things in modern civilization. And just want to read this in honor of the green man and why we're here. This quote again, Thomas Berry, whenever we forget our story, we become confused, but the winds and the rivers and the mountains never become confused. We must go to them constantly to be reminded of it. For every being in the universe is what it is only through its participation in the story. We must respect the powers of the surrounding universe only through a sensitive insertion of ourselves into the great celebration of the Earth community can we expect the support of that community. If we violate the integrity of that community, we will die. It's this idea of the importance of reconnecting um, historically, not with books and archives and libraries, but with the places themselves. So, we have another very famous place in Oxfordshire, um, the White Horse, Uffington. And this is an example of one of the many, many places that I call a perennial pilgrimage site. <laughs> um, it has never been unvisited by people of, of any type throughout any era. And it has its own resonance and energy. And today, there are many customs that still happen there locally on the folklore level. Um, the idea of keeping the chalk white and everything, it's a community effort as well. So there's, you have the ancient history, and then you have these overlays through the centuries of what happened there, which brings to mind the next thing that I want you to keep in the back of our, our minds too, is the concept of memory. When we say the past, we usually mean what is it that we remember? What do we recall? What is it that resonates with us? How do we reconnect with that? And with historical places, there is never any one memory because each place has an overlay of many different memories of the people that live there and made the place, those that visit there. So it's this, this constant interaction both ways between the place and us constantly. So every footstep we take when we're walking, we are encoding and decoding the memories of that place. So it's just this idea that throughout history, pilgrimage grew out of an, under, an inherent understanding of this many, many eons ago. And of course, we have the idea of the ancient world. It's classic. I'm just going to show two or three of these. Won't linger there too long. Delphi in Greece, the concept of an oracle. Many people go to sacred places today also. But the idea of, again, getting information that's new or helpful in some way, can the idea that you have to go to that place or that shrine, in this case, the Sybil, the priestess who would channel the energy. So they, there are ideas in various countries. Every country is different. Every region is unique in how they express their meaning about pilgrimage and places. But Delphi, even today, in ruins, is still a very powerful and favorite site. Another perennial pilgrimage place. And it's also a hybrid site, in a sense, historically, because the historical energy is there, but yet our modern time is there, and that's why we're going back. The people who've had repeat visits there have interesting stories to tell as well, as they do at Roslyn and others. So the idea that there is not one memory to recall or think about when you go to any sacred place is true historically. Okay, next. And then, of course, Egypt. This is the... Um, Temple of Philae, Isis, um, is an example of one of the many um, temples there. Again, the idea of places that have been resonant a very long time, 
but in particular with many people now throughout um, different parts of the world. I know David and others have fascinating connecting lines and maps. Um, it would be interesting beyond Britain and Europe, some of the connections to some of these other sites that in recent years, for better or for worse in some areas, <laughs> uh, there's been a lot of increasing interest in going to these places and for many things. And um, I think also David touched on this idea. And I want to just mention this briefly before we get into the high middle ages. But the idea that certain rulers in history, whether it's a king or a pharaoh or whatever, they wanted to build their own buildings and everything and enhance them for spiritual healing or good reasons. But also at times, as they did with certain types of music, they were threatened by certain things. Certain places, they would, they would want to stop the energy. There, so it can work either way, depending on who's in power at any given time. And in, in medieval history in particular, we run across a change in leadership has a totally different attitude about a particular shrine or a sacred site. It can be a totally different thing. And then there's a new person that comes into power. And how that pilgrimage site is perceived changes yet again. So the memory of it is affected by those kind of things too, okay? And then we have Samothrace. This is an amazing sanctuary of the gods of ancient Greece. Very, very um, resonant and a very important um, Western memory point for a lot of people, um, many ways today, um, about the idea of communing directly with the gods and expression of that, again, in a very powerful landscape anyway, whether there's a temple there or not, which is another reason. Today we tend to think of the building itself as the site. Like, oh, some will say, I went to the temple or the church of such and such, but they often forget, but what was the ground you were actually walking on? Um, I mentioned Rosalind again, only to say it is the glen right there also that is rarely mentioned, and yet it is absolutely central. So even historical sites like this, it is the landscape also is equally or often more important than the, any building or ruin that remains because it's a connection to our consciousness when we're there that is more longer term. It often affects us deeper and people have their own um, inner growth or experience. And if you go back again, you'll often have a different take on it and that is, that is equally powerful and interesting. Um, now, <laughs> here we go. The High Middle Ages period. Um, I've had several really fascinating questions with some of you at lunch about different aspects of the late Middle Ages. I'll mention a few as they're relevant to pilgrimage when I can. But this is one of the classic portrayals we have, again, um, I want to also bash this sacred cow. Not mm -hmm. only do we tend to limit our perception of what history is or was, we, we really have a serious problem nowadays with the word pilgrim. You mentioned pilgrim somewhere just at a train station. Or I tried this out actually at King's Cross one day, extra hour in the cafe. I thought, oh, I was gonna ask them, what do you, when I say the word pilgrimage, what comes to mind? It's fascinating. Try it. You'll get you'll get some really interesting answers. But the pilgrim people will often say, "Pilgrim, oh yes, isn't that that's the Camino? Oh, that's Compostela, you know that's." But it's it's like the concept of who frames the issues is still very much. Um, sadly, and I say this as I love the Middle Ages in many ways, but there's a, there's a power of control there in our perception of the word pilgrim. We tend to think of it only in medieval terms a lot, um, or in, the, in terms of the ancient world. But today, we tend to say we're journeying or something, traveling. But, but this is the classic idea of the, of the early pilgrim, um, not the sacred pilgrim, because there were actually very many reasons why you went on pilgrimage in the Middle Ages. Not all of them were necessarily good or easy, not all of them were religious. There were quite a few secular travelers also, and everyone would be heading 
pretty much for the same destination, at least initially. Okay. So here's to the Canterbury line. <laughs> um, Canterbury stained glass windows are actually some of the, the very best quality um, medieval glasswork anywhere, certainly in, in England and Britain, if not in parts of Europe. But they feature pilgrims in many different um, areas and poses. And this one, they're on their way to see Thomas the Becket Shrine, which was the, the great focus of Canterbury Cathedral itself. So why would they want to go only to the shrine, we might think today? Today we want to go explore the whole area and the whole place and the carvings and see all of it. But that was not the focus or purpose of a medieval pilgrim's journey. Because the first thing, canon law of the church eventually required people to go on a pilgrimage of some type. If you were elderly or ill or something, you could get credits off that and you, you could uh, entertain um, people in your home if they were traveling through your area, um, provide hospice care or something like that. But th the deal was you had to go somewhere, <laughs> um, preferably Rome or the Holy Land, if you could afford that, and that length, or Compostela, or Canterbury, um, Durham, all these places. But the requirement was when you went there, you were to focus on the shrine of the saint and the holy relics, and that was a lot of what it was about. But it wasn't about worshiping the relics, it was veneration. It's a slightly different concept. A lot of people today miss um, so they're on their way, okay, and the next one is they are now at the shrine, which of course we have many, many brilliant examples here in England, many cathedrals, I won't get into all of that. Many of you already know that and have been there also. But I just wanted to mention that a medieval pilgrim's focus, partly because they had to go to the shrine, for one good reason, <laughs> they had to bring back a badge testifying or certifying that they've been there in, in reality and not just said they were there. <laughs> so it, was a, it became a very interesting way to um, develop what became the art of pilgrim badges. And if anyone is ever in London with a spare couple of hours, I cannot recommend highly enough, the Museum of London has an incredible collection of medieval pilgrim's badges from Canterbury, Walsingham, all these places on the continent. It's really great. It's, it's a good couple of hours. It's fascinating to see what they looked like, what they were about. Um, but the idea was to fulfill the requirement of going to X number of shrines for various reasons. Um, obviously, the further you could afford to travel, the better. You come back with you know more um, badges. But this is Canterbury glass, and it's absolutely stunning, and the blue color here as it chart, um, which is even a separate issue slightly, but it's even more brilliant blue color, um, is among the most unusual type of glass, and it was expensive, as was red. Red glass was really a premium in the high Middle Ages because in order to get red glass, you had to have flecks of gold in there when you made the mixture. So it's very, very expensive. So a lot of cathedrals, they wanted to show not only that they had the greatest shrine and the, and the most valued relics, but that if they had red glass, that was kind of a you know, status thing also. So it was kind of all part of that more limited mentality, you could say, of how pilgrimage was perceived then and then, of course, we have um, the, the great draw, and even today, went to Compostela. And they had something called the Camino, the way, the way to Compostela, which was a path. There were four main ways to get there from um, here and also down in France. Um, in fact, Bezelay was one of the departure points. Uh, others. So the idea was you would travel along the way but it was a motley crew of travelers. <laughs> they weren't all religious travelers. This is the, the usual image we have. Again, 
I'm sort of contesting that because <coughs> the records show that there were a lot of other types of pilgrims, some of which were heretic, heretics who had been accused um, of various things, not outright crimes, but crime of belief. And they were, it's a type of um, medieval probation system that they had to go on a required pilgrimage. Not to where they wanted to go, but they were like told, okay, you will go to Rocamador, you will go to, you know, Bezalé. And it turned out that gradually over the years, um, we know this from the accounting records because everyone had to bring an offering. So some of the coins were legal and legitimate, and they were left, but some weren't. So <laughs> we have some of the largest assortment of illegal medieval coins because <laughs> left at certain shrines um, that strangely, this is one of the vagaries of history, how do you find out certain facts? Well, it's often, like with Templar history, it's looking at the actual accounting records of where certain things were and what isn't there. What the absence of something can often reveal quite a bit. So the symbol of the scallop shell became key for St. John, St. James of Compostela, and it still is. And this is an example of a stone carving um, on the way. It's about um, 30 miles, just right before you get to Compostela. They have the, the, the scallop shell and a system of how many more miles we have yet to go. Okay. So the symbolism and pilgrimage have long been deeply interconnected. <coughs> and again, we have this, this is a modern day example, a few years ago. Um, this much further, and the symbol again of the, the, the scallop shell. Okay. And this is an example of an of a actual medieval pilgrim's passport book, meaning that he, could, he or she could prove they had been to these shrines um, it looks very much like a you throw, you know, Sam, you come, yeah. come back from you know, <laughs> traveling. Um, it's the same principle, but you had to come back with a, a legitimate proof of not only the pilgrim's badge, but the stamp to say that you've actually been there. Okay. And then this is another issue about the labyrinth. It's very um, ancient theme, as we know, um, from Crete and many, many other countries around the world have labyrinths and mazes. But they aren't identical because the labyrinth, generally speaking, has many different circuits. Um, this is the most, one of the most famous and one of our favorites in the West, certainly, Chartres. And the idea at that time in the medieval mind was you would travel to the center. And a labyrinth does not offer, like a maze does, many difficult blockages. Um, along the way where you would often get lost, or confused, but it has a lot of circuitry that many would say relates more to the actual landscape that the cathedral is built on, perhaps. Um, there's a lot of interesting research and debate being done now about this, but the idea that the pilgrim must make his or her way through this to the center and then back out, that there's one way inevitably in a labyrinth <laughs> you will end up at the center. So people wonder why did there end up being things like labyrinths or gargoyles and things like this in a Christian building? Who was on the committee that approved these things? Um, they had a lot of reasons for this, partly because many people could not read and there wasn't um, a lot of um, broadening of information. It was, in fact, even among the clergy, only about 15, 20% in 12th century Paris. Even though they could read, they still didn't have access to some of the Plato and Socrates and manuscripts, things like that. So the church felt they'd like to include certain elements up from the ancient world and ancient wisdom, but not all of them, just what they wanted. So the labyrinth was very well thought of because of it had only one way to get to the center. And the church saw that as a metaphor at the time for going to the New Jerusalem. It's like a symbolic journey the pilgrim would make. But you couldn't start the journey in the 12th or 13th century. You could not enter the labyrinth until you'd done um, a ritual blessing and a washing at the beginning by the door. 
baptismal thing. Then you could go forward. So the idea that it had to be a purification and a shedding of one's previous life, ideas, bad habits, all these things, before you could go on through the labyrinth to the center, back out again, and then you could proceed on into the larger nave of the cathedral. So you had, it was quite a big series of steps. This was after you actually made it to the site in the first place. I mean, it was an incredibly <laughs> difficult journey. But this universal symbolism from many, many centuries before was integrated in Chartres and quite a few other cathedrals. And sacred geometry is involved. It's a principle that was studied widely. 12th century Paris, in the church also. They read Plato and all these philosophers. They were aware of it. Um, but the issues around what they were going to do with some of that information, because they recognized the power of it. So they had to be careful what elements they chose to emphasize or not. Okay. And then this is Saffron Waldron, one of my favorites, actually. Um, turf maze, also. And it is an extraordinary example of um, a different type of circuitry. And that some of the experiences that people describe when they go to a labyrinth or a turf maze in modern day time is amazing. But it's the return visits. It's the going back again, even after five years, and say you go back to this site, do the labyrinth. Um, people will often report a whole different thing they notice. Oh, they think, oh, I didn't see that before. That's interesting or I hadn't thought of that. And, you know, again, it's, it's that you're plugging into a different layer of time, space, and consciousness at that time. And you'll notice other things about the site physically also. This is true in cathedrals. And every time I go back to Chart or Roslyn, for example, I learn something new. I see something I didn't see. Um, I might see something I did see, but I'll, I'll perceive it differently. So it's, it's our being open to a new experience wherever we go on any pilgrimage or journey. But the main point for any pilgrim in any era was another principle. And keep in the back of our minds as we go on to the end. Um, the idea that you don't need a fixed destination like you had to have in medieval times, for example. That was required. If you had one thing you had to do it, you had to get there, and you had to know where you were going. But instead, the journey itself is the destination. It is in the journey, it is in that questing that is the actual pilgrimage. And uh, that principle is woven in and out through the tapestry of a lot of our Middle Ages history and carvings. But it comes from the earlier times from this time, this era and earlier, okay. Um, so we have, again, um, Sarah mentioned Desiree and Mary Magdalene. I'm going to mention the Black Madonnas just briefly. They're um, very popular today. A lot of visitors now want to reconnect with elements of the Divine Feminine also. This one is from a Templar site in Picardy. It's called Loud. And it's very interesting. There's a huge cathedral there, and there's a temple museum next door. And this particular Black Madonna um, is very interesting. She has a, a, several unusual artistic features from the sculptural standpoint. Very, very large hands. Um, and she's portrayed holding the baby in a different position. You know, there's, there's all these different kinds of um, ways that the uh, shrine was positioned. And especially so with black Madonnas in areas. So this, she's very high up the shrine. She's not face on, she's up, you have to look up to, to her. Um, but they change the, the shroud around her in certain um, church festivities today, and they have flowers and um, singing and everything. And, but um, black Madonnas are a very complex issue. A lot of their symbolism goes way back to the ancient world, um, to the ancient goddesses and, and different aspects of that, that again were reintegrated and reworked into the 12th, 13th century symbols. And the Black Madonnas are usually made of wood, ironically. If they are made of stone, it's usually jet. It's 
off in jet. And this is interesting from Royston Caves. Um, again, it's a very fascinating site here in England. This is St. Catherine. And I bring this up um, two or three reasons. One is to introduce the medieval concept of a saint, of course. We've heard that. But saints have their symbols. And St. Catherine has the eight-sided wheel, which she has here, certainly holding it up this time. Um, usually, if you see an eight-sided wheel in, in certain medieval building a certain direction area, you know it's a tribute to St. Catherine. The Templars liked her in particular as one of their female saints because she was a martyr and this whole idea of um, fighting to the bitter end no matter what, which is one of the Templar credos, you might say, for better or for worse. But the idea of St. Catherine's um, blessing was very important to them when they were imprisoned in certain areas. We'll get to that a bit more. I was fascinated that David brought up prisons because one of them is very related to this, uh, this issue. But um, the, some of the idea of um, who to pray to or ask for help in your 11th hour was a big issue in a lot of medie medieval pilgrims because before they left, they didn't know if they would come back and if, you know what was going to happen. So they had the make arrangements before they left for their family and everything. So they would often, the Templars would often ask St. Catherine's blessing for the journey. Today, a lot of people would ask St. Christopher, you know, this patron saint of travel. So, I mean, there are this idea of getting intercession um, is there. But the sacred geometry of the eight-sided wheel is also, if you connect it a certain way, you end up with an octagon. And of course, at Amiens Cathedral, we have an eight-sided labyrinth there. It's an example. Okay. And then the idea of a relic or an object, an artifact that was cherished, brought into a lot of the shrines. This is the Veil of Veronica, which um, is just one example of um, the late medieval idea. It's kind of an obsession with certain cloths, not just the shroud and the mandoline, but just other, other saints. Some of them were female, like in this example, um, but they were often kept in a special casket. And if some pilgrims could also go see those, they got an additional badge, that type of thing. Okay, so this one is an example of um, a modern day pilgrimage custom that's built on earlier traditions and happens to be Oxfordshire at Charlton on Moor. Small church on May Day, the entire church, and especially the main cross and the altar and everything, are completely covered in greenery. And they have a festivity um, after the, the service. And they, they have a Morris men come in later and do dancing out on the pavement. So I mean, it's the idea of the hybridization of customs at a sacred place that you can get even now in a lot of churches and, and different areas. But a lot of them are very regionalized, sort of localized customs. And then we have this idea, too, of the, in the stone masonry, the carvings. Some of the Green Man carvings are actually found on the corner. You know, we, we expect to see them, like, on the wall or an altar or something, but they often are sort of split either way. And the idea was he was a guardian, you know, at the corner, because he had one eye on either side would watch the pilgrims approach. And so, so certain buildings. You'll, you'll see this quite a bit, Green Man. It's, and his foliage continues on for some time, some churches, it goes halfway around the building. Okay. And this is um, Walsingham, the idea of water. Um, several um, speakers this morning brought up the issue of sacred wells and <coughs> springs. There's lots of them here, of course. Just, just running through this quickly, just give you an idea. And then um, this is another example there of you know, this is Clerkenwell in London, but again, the idea that the, the names of places today often relate to medieval pilgrimage. Clerkenwell, for example, um, even the Templars, like if you get off at Holborn, for example, you were standing on the first Knights Templar commander base in London. It was only later that it moved to the existing site called New Temple, the Temple Church, that we heard a bit more about in recent years. So again, places have a resonance of name, 
Some names rarely change over many centuries because people traveled there. So examples of Clerkenwell in particular is, is really solid in that way, historically. And Sarah, <laughs> we have Arthur's seat. This is the other side of the south side. <laughs> um, we have a very big, strong experience of Edinburgh, many years there. But the idea of, in this case, I wanted to bring in the idea of the four elements in relation to this pilgrimage site. Pilgrimage sites are not just about the earth. We think that because, you know, oh, we're there on the walking and we're connecting with the earth and the roots, that's great. But it's not the only thing because, for example, this place is actually an ancient volcano, literally. Ge some geologists still come here to study this place from all over the world today. And it's the element of fire. It's still kind of a remnant there. We have other places that have, um, obviously, water and air around them. Some of the most powerful pilgrimage sites, even today, are often a conglomeration of two or three elements in one place, even now, as ruins or something called extinct or ancient, which is still a mecca for a lot of visitors. This is just around the corner from Holyrood. I find that rather interesting. <laughs> And, of course, we have modern customs. This Edinburgh Festival, the fire worshiper and the, the juggler. <laughs> and, again, the figure of the fool or the jester. It's a big one in a lot of um, medieval festivities for various reasons and purposes. So we see a lot of his imagery in churches and cathedrals and places of pilgrimage. Also, you see a lot of saints and very serious, solemn, sacred imagery. And then you'll see a jester across from a green man, or you know, this kind of awareness about where things are placed in a building in relation to what. Because nothing is independent on its own in these buildings. And the stonemasons knew that, and they incorporated that. And they used sacred geometry to emphasize certain things. They're not always right next to each other. So again, the jester figure pops up Modern times, we see them a lot like this at carnivals and things like that. But, um, and then, of course, the tower. This is one I had to pop this in. This, I took this about this about last year in November, kind of real foggy day. But we're going to introduce the idea of prisons again briefly <coughs> from the medieval standpoint. You don't want to know. <laughs> but the Knights Templar in London, for example, when Push came to shove and a serious crunch happened. And on um, France, originally, of course, we know that Friday the 13th, 1307, is when um, the king and the pope colluded to have the French Templars <coughs> rounded up. But in England, it wasn't so easy. There was a lot of opposition initially, and it wasn't for a good year after that, at least, before they were even rounded up, let alone any further proceedings. So in 1308, that what was they were able to find of the existing English Templars were taken initially to the tower, but it was too crowded for too many other prisoners there. So, next, they had to take them next door to a place called All Hallows by the Tower, the church next door. Um, you just go up from the tube station that's on the roadside. So this church is loaded with history. I mean, technically, the building itself is a bit more modern now, but its roots, um, this is from the Undercroft, the crypt, you might say. It's an incredible museum, of actually a very good one for Saxon remains in London and other things. But this is the altarpiece down there, and those three altar stones at the base of it were brought back um, by the English Knights Templar in the Crusades from Castle Pilgrim in the Holy Land. The English brought the cart of them all the way back to London, but they wanted them there, right by the tower. They, the name of that energy line, David. <laughs> you know, so the, the, this energy of these three altar stones, um, partly because they believe some of the English temples had helped um, along the way with pilgrims and perhaps maybe some of the stonemasons and interchanges of knowledge. And so they were allowed to take these three stones. So you can go there today, you just pop downstairs, you can actually see this. Um, it's the kind of thing 
Uh, you know, we, we often don't visit places in our own backyard or whatever. Um, if visitors come, we'll go to the town, hmm. for example. But next time, if you have an extra few minutes, go next door, go downstairs, and see three original stones from that time, late 12th century. And this is the, the Temple Church today, um, which we've heard a lot about. But this is the actual, the ceiling design is really, really wonderful. Um, we have a lot of emphasis on the so-called effigies, most of which are actually not Knights Templar there, technically. And the carvings and the stained glass, which are all very lovely. We have interesting carvings in this section. It's more modern now on the roof. But the sacred geometry is incredible here. It really is good, and they, there are some carvings of jesters and other interesting figures there. But again, it's part of what is known as the ends of court, the temple area. Um, it's very powerful history on many fronts, but again, it has a temple connection. And David also, I think, mentioned on one of his lines, Lindisfarne. This is a very important place also in Celtic Christianity early on and, and pagan places. Um, this is a sunset, just happened to catch over Lindisfarne one time. Um, but again, the idea of the north, northern people and the northern connections along the sea, um, a lot of the, the pilgrimage sites in southern Scotland were actually done from maritime means and not by just land. So one if by land, two if by sea, you know. There are many ways to travel. We often forget today when the word pilgrim is mentioned, we think on the road, on the physical earth, walking a path. However, in late Middle Ages, you were very much wanting, if at all possible, for a lot of reasons, <laughs> um, to get on a ship. Especially if you were really lucky, you could get a place on one of the Templar ships that happened to be going to the Middle East. They could drop you off places along the way for security. So maritime travel was a big thing, a lot of ships, so we see a lot of that kind of um, action happening in a time when we don't tend to think. History books leave a lot of this out anyway. I think a lot of earlier peoples had a lot more intelligence and means to get around than we've been told. Okay. And of course, we have Kalanish in um, the Hebrides. This is on the Isle of Lewis. And this is a very, very, very one of my favorite Scottish sites, actually for a lot of reasons. It has a special lunar aspect, the way you can view the moon and how it was constructed and, and thought out. But it's part of a larger network. There's several ever smaller stone circles there. But again, it's, as I mentioned earlier, the idea of a perennial pilgrimage site. It's always been a pilgrimage site through any period in history. But each time, it was for a slightly different purpose. The focus was different. It wasn't only for the same thing. We cannot go back to an era exactly the way it was. Now, we can try to recreate things or do things, go there, but we, we have to reinvent our own ways also at certain places like this. But Kalanish today is one of very known in the archaeoastronomy community. It's, it's, got a, it's a very, very good place to go to. And it's an example of another point so I'm wrapping up to um, from T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets. It's a really fascinating poem. But there's a concept in there called, it's about the still point of the turning world. And I like this a lot regarding pilgrimage because in ancient times, people went there to find a still point or connect with something deeper. They may or may not consciously know what that was. They didn't necessarily have a fixed idea their destination, they were open to the new, and a lot of the turning world around us, many would argue, is getting faster and faster. So the need for a deeper stillness has never been greater. And so it is, it is actually the stories, the folklore, and the songs that are embedded in this memory, the decoded encoding and the, and the layers of history, at any given site. So there's a lot of different things at any place that you can connect with. Um, it's not always the same. 
hopefully inspire you even more when you go back, or you may have a dream about where you've been. Um, this is the Roll Rights in Oxfordshire. Again, there's a lot of really amazing layers of history here, and it's still a very popular um, place to go visit and do blessings and ceremonies today. But we cannot do them exactly the way it was way back. But it's very interesting to contemplate the time of year you go visit someplace, um, the day, the purpose. Sometimes you get there and you'll think, oh, this isn't actually what we were here for. So you can you know, be creative and go with the moment. And that's something that we, we have the blessing for now that a lot of people in the ancient world did not necessarily have, including ancient Greece and other places. It was a bit more rigid than we realize in certain ways. So we are fortunate in that way. And of course, Glastonbury Tour is legendary. <laughs> there are no words, truly. Um, again, there are many layers of ancient history and knowledge here, and medieval history also. Um, and currently, it's, history is in the making. It's a fluid process. It's not finished or done. We're not stuck in history class anymore. <laughs> we've got the internet, we've got each other, and we're here today because, our, in fact, our getting here is a bit of a pilgrimage too. Life is a pilgrimage, but our journey is the destination, and it's the journeying of that that is the meaning of it, and it always has been throughout historical times. Okay. So it's not getting stuck on the, this narrow idea of what a pilgrim is, what a pilgrimage is, or can be, because we can reinvent that and make it what we wish. And it's reconnecting with the land, the lore, the songs, and the stories, and our ancestors, when we're there, and when we go home. So to a medieval pilgrim, they, they knew that they had to go and all that, but what they were really, really they could get an incubation dream. They believed that they could get a blessing, thanks or something from that home. Knowledge that would come to them about a place, even after they have left it, even after you visited and come home. The process of pilgrimage isn't over. In fact, it's ongoing. You know, you still, still get inspirations about that. So I think the, the final point I wanted to make Norwich Cathedral, famous gray man, golden, golden gray man in the cloisters area. Um, again, it's the concept of joy and celebration at sacred sites. And we often are surprised, medieval people think, well, why, why are there green men in a, in a medieval cathedral? It's supposed to be really solemn. Um, there's a lot of that principle of both the shadow and the joy in every cathedral, every place, and in every landscape. There's day and then there's night. Um, we have to be aware of those shifting tides and flows at every place we go. So I think, you know, just re-examining um, what a pilgrim is, what a pilgrimage is or was, and redefining what it can mean now. Pilgrimage can mean many, many things now. Um, we have a pilgrimage of the mind, pilgrimage of the body, we're walking, pilgrimage of the spirit, which can happen anywhere. Um, so it's, it's being open to the numinous, the liminal, the place between the worlds. That is often what a real journey or pilgrimage can do. It can activate that in us. And we can help do that with the land, with, with each other when we're there. Sort of a mutual sharing at the right moment. But some of the most powerful events, in fact, we had a chat at lunch about this, it was great, involve something called synchronicity or coincidence. Sometimes it's when you weren't planning on something. It's precisely when it pops into your life or it shows up on a pilgrimage or a journey. Sometimes the wrong train is the one that you really were meant to get. Mm. You weren't supposed to go on that one because the next one's coming along. So it, again, pilgrimage today, is much more flexible and fluid than it's ever been in history. So wherever you go, the final thing is from an Eastern sage, Confucius did say once, 
If you go on pilgrimage, wherever you go, go with all your heart. Debt Free TV, in association with getoutofdebtfree.org.